I'm Dr. Bill Lyle and I practice obstetrics and gynecology and over the years I have delivered over 4,000 babies. Welcome today because today is special because this is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Since 1973 we have lost over 63 million babies lives because of abortion and abortion at its very core is an attack against the image of God. Genesis 1.26 says, After God created all the heavens and the earth, all the mammals, all the birds, and everything on this planet, God paused and he said, Let us make man in our image. And that is all of us. Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, and we were all created in the image of God. And we weren't created in the image of God on the day we were born. We were created in the image of God at that moment of conception. 
when we look at 63 million lives, that is doing evil in the sight of the Lord, destroying the image of God. And this is what the attack is. It's an attack against the image of God out of a hatred for God himself. We look at Psalm 139 where we are miraculously knit together in our mother's womb. The psalmist didn't understand about cell differentiation and fetal development. He just knew that it was knit together in the mother's womb. From the moment of conception when one cell from the mom and one cell from the dad get together, at that moment that is a unique new person. Unique from the mom, unique from the dad, unique from the other 8 billion people on the planet. And then we go from one cell to two cells to four, eight, 16, 32, 64, developing into different systems, cardiovascular system, neurological system, skeletal systems. 18 days after conception, we can actually see the heart beating. And the heart is pumping blood from the baby to the placenta where the mom is and then back. And the babies not only have different genetics, but often the babies can even have a different blood type. It's really a matter of not just a choice. It is a matter of patients' rights and being created in the image of God. You say, well, why patients' rights? Because we treat the babies in the womb as patients. And a patient is a person, no matter how small. And I really think that God is looking saying, you have this amazing opportunity. We have reversed Roe versus Wade. What is the church going to do to defend my preborn, to discuss the gift of salvation and forgiveness, and to provide healing for not only the church, but those outside of the church? Because if the truth is not going to be heard from our pulpits, where do we expect to hear the truth? So the church needs to engage, and the church doesn't just need to know the truth, the church needs to speak the truth. They need to stand up for the preborn. They need to say this is wrong, but they also need to discuss about forgiveness and healing. See how you can get engaged. And if you have any questions, you can contact me, Dr. Bill Weil, through our website, which is prolifedoc.org. God bless you, and thank you for setting aside Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. I'm looking for my cough drops just in case. So I would like to make a little more, just a few comments on the little video. Um, not every year, but <clears throat> every few years I try to dedicate an entire message to Sanctity of Life Sunday. And um, t today is not one of those because I have another, I am so excited about being back in Matthews, I just couldn't break myself away from it. But I do want to recognize this, and the brother that um, spoke there uh, alluded to some of this scripture that I wanted to read you and make a comment on. And you'll find it in Psalm, Psalms 139 and beginning in verse 14. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. O oh God, how great is the sum of them. 
When did God start considering and thinking about the child? Was it as he said at birth? Or was it when that first sperm entered that womb and impregnated that woman? That's when it was. So folks, I just, um, I want you to be aware that one of the things, if you are associated with this church, you need to know where we stand on this. Number one, in fact, like today's message is about sin. Uh, in a further explanation of that, but at the same time, regardless of what your human condition is, there is forgiveness. But you must understand me. If this be your lot in life, you're in one of two classes this morning. You are those who have realized what abortion was in your life and come to the Lord with it. And you have found Jesus sweet and loving and caring. And you are forgiven. And then there's another group. If that is your experience, and you have not, or continue to avoid the reality of that act, then you're in darkness. There's no other way to decide it. And that is not the place to have conversations about your rights. So I just want you to know that the way that sin and all other sins are dealt with is through Jesus Christ. He's it. He's the answer. So I just want you to keep that thought in mind. I've counseled where I can't tell you how many women. And it's been my sincere pleasure to see their faces light up when somebody finally explained to them that Jesus loved them and that he forgives all sin. By the way, I still love doing that for women. So anyone can come to me or call me at any time. There is help and there is peace available. Okay. And thank you for being here this morning. You know, it's an awful temptation when you first stick your nose out of your door and feel that cold. So I really appreciate each one of you being here this morning. If you're comfortable doing so, please stand and remain silent for the reading of God's inspired and infallible word. It is in Matthew, it is in the ninth chapter, and we're beginning with rereading the 13th verse of the ninth chapter. We dealt with that last week, but I wanted to set the stage with it again this week. But go ye and learn what that meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Then came to him the disciples of John, John the Baptist, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn? as long as the bridegroom is with them. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles. 
else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. Let us pray. Father, these are the words of your only begotten Son. You sent him here to show us the way and reveal the deeper truths of God the Father. And we thank you for that. As we go into this now, help our minds to be open and may we be receptive to the move of the Holy Spirit and how, how this scripture speaks to each one of us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of today's message is Sinners Enjoying Jesus. And let me just get right off, right up front saying, I'm one of those sinners and I really, really, really enjoy Jesus. In fact, you cannot really enjoy Jesus until you've realized you're a sinner. You never can appreciate Him. All the lovey-dovey talk about who Jesus is and all the wonderful things He said and Jesus loves everybody, it means nothing until the Holy Spirit teaches you, calls you and says you are a sinner and I'm here to help. The holidays are over. And we've returned to the Gospel of Matthew inspired by the Holy Spirit and written down for us by the worst kind of sinner. You cannot help but understand that Jesus really loved and enjoyed sinners during his ministry here on earth. And once the sinners around Jesus, and there was always a lot of them there, picked up on the fact that he did truly love and enjoy them, they loved and enjoyed him also. Matthew chapter 8 recorded for us Jesus' power over nature by calming the raging sea as well as calming the frightened disciples and leaving them wondering, who is this man? What kind of man is this that speaks and the sea obeys? Then, again in chapter 8, immediately after landing their boat in the region of the Gadareans, these disciples of Jesus see him encounter the Gadarean demoniacs, as it says in one of the Gospels. Negotiating, they saw him negotiate directly and calmly with legions of demons. Well, that's not a normal thing for the average man to do, is it? Or if it is, it's a real problem for you. Then they see him cast them all out into 2,000 pigs, which promptly destroy themselves by running headlong into the sea. The pig owners did not celebrate the dramatic redemption of that terrible, terribly bound sinner, did they? Who was doomed and on his way to hell. Now they find out that he's been placed into the kingdom of God. And all they want is for Jesus to leave. Saving sinners cost way too much for most professing Christians. Did you know that? It's too expensive. We preach and teach about the value of a soul, don't we? One soul is worth it all. But hesitate when we're asked to sacrifice our time and our money, many people, to actually do what Jesus taught us in that story. These disciples of Jesus were the first to experience 
what believers today take for granted. Namely that every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Have you found that to be the case? Amen to that. Of course, if you know Jesus, if you go to bed tonight knowing Him, you're going to get up tomorrow just a little bit closer to going to heaven and being with Him. It's more joy. It's more happiness. It's a wonderfully sweet thing to do. But also, every day, these disciples with Jesus saw Him disrupt things, change things, add fullness and different interpretations to Scriptures, and teach things in new ways that they found hard to swallow. And they loved Jesus. But they were having a hard time seeing Him do things they had never seen Him do before. They were often just as resistant to Jesus' new and different teachings as were the Pharisees and the scribes. Early on in Jesus' ministry, all those incredible miracles that so angered the self-righteous religious leaders and left his disciples wondering about Jesus also had certainly established his power. His friend and foes knew he had power. And as Nicodemus the Pharisee admitted to Jesus directly, we know you must be from God because no man can do the miracles, exhibit the power in so many words that you do, unless he be from God. But no matter how much power Jesus displayed, no matter how wonderful his teachings he has up to the beginning of chapter 9, chosen to not clearly reveal why he came. First in chapter 9, a man sick of the palsy is lowered down through a roof directly in front of Jesus by his friends. Jesus, seeing their faith, speaks to the sick man and says, Cheer up, your sins are forgiven. What an amazing thing to say to a sick man. No one had ever said that to a sick man before. Jesus, knowing the evil thoughts in the Bible-believing, self-righteous Pharisees' hearts and in their minds, says this, Matthew 9, verses 5 and 6. For whether it is easy to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. So Jesus again begins, to, he begins again to more clearly delineate and separate all the miracles and everything which were done primarily for signs for the Jews to help people understand why he came. Jesus has now, in those words, officially put sin, sinners, and forgiveness on the table of every human being's life. He is now explaining why he came down from heaven. Um, you know, I love my surveys and statistics and all of that. What percentage of Christians, when asked why Jesus came, identified the main reason as to save sinners? A good survey, a really good one, will, half the people will say he came to save sinners. But the other 50% of Christians will say he came to bless us. He came to take us to heaven. No. He came for one reason. Everything else is an ancillary fact regarding to why he came. We're lost. 
and we're lost in sin. And there is no hope for any of us. So now he's blatantly insulted the religious leaders by proving he could cure what really ails us all, and that's our sins. Jesus proceeds to call the despised tax collector and traitor to his country, Matthew, to come and follow him. And Matthew does. But by taking the worst possible sinner into his inner circle, every good and decent follower of God and keeper of the Mosaic law knew Jesus had given them all the evidence they needed to execute him as a blasphemer. Because after all, only God can forgive sins. Folks, when your mind is made up and the Holy Spirit has not touched you and softened your heart to understand that you're being called out of your sin to be saved, you aren't going to accept the truth of these scriptures I preach today anyway. You're in your sin and you will remain in your sin until the Holy Spirit moves. So I would suggest that one of the ways that the Holy Spirit works on hard hearts is with little twinges of guilt and reminders that something's not quite right. Now you can expect that to grow to the point that you have to willfully make a decision to not respond to the call. You have to, make, you have to willfully do that. And that is an extremely unhealthy thing to do for your soul. Then as if Jesus hadn't done enough to shake his disciples who also hated tax collectors or publicans and so angered the good people, the righteous people, that his death was now a foregone conclusion. Jesus makes this situation even worse and destroys what was left of his reputation in Matthew 9 verses 10 through 13. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, in Matthew's house, behold many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? How can any man that clearly has power from God associate with sinners? Therefore, unwilling to accept him, their conclusion is what? That his power is from the devil. And that's as clear a blaspheming of the Holy Ghost as you can get right there. If people ask me all the time, what does that mean? Here's what it means. You attribute to the evil one anything that's clearly from God. And you've committed blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth, and I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And last week, you know, I shared with you that that is a quote by Jesus from the book of Hosea. I think it's the sixth chapter and the sixth verse. Even in the Old Testament, under, under the Mosaic law, with all that ritualism, ritualism and as well as all those sacrifices, God was still complaining against the leaders and the people of Israel and later Judea by saying, all I want you people to do is love me, show mercy on each other, and then I'll accept your sacrifices. 
But between now and then, until you learn how to do that and start listening to me and my prophets that I send to you, you're in danger. And how dang, and what kind of danger were they? Their entire nation were wiped out. And only a, only a remnant was saved. Now it is true that Israel had had many prophets come preaching repentance. That in itself would not have alarmed the religious leaders that Jesus was always at odds with. But remember the healing of the man with the palsy. Jesus forgave the man's sins first. This is the priority, church. The priority of the church of the living God is not a big healing service. It is not looking for material blessings. It is to gather together and pray for the salvation of lost sinners. And then do what the Holy Spirit leads you to do. Remember, you were not saved to go to heaven. If you've been saved and you're still here, you have been saved to remain here and be a witness to lead the lost to Jesus. It is the only charter that we have in this church. It's the only reason we exist here and maintain this building on this dirt. Jesus now, with, the, with his statements that I've gone over, has made it very clear that he has no interest at all in being around good and decent, self-righteous people trying to get to heaven by doing their good works. Why? Because there aren't any, and those who would be saved by him would all know they were sinners. And they would know that they had to confess that. The tragedy of Judaism and its corrupt practices in Jesus' time is that none of them in their own minds were sinners. They were saved because they were born to Jew. They could not grasp being born again. And people who aren't sinners can't be saved. Did you know that? If you don't see yourself and know yourself to be a sinner, you have no chance at salvation. It is an absolute requirement. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And until you know you're lost, nothing will change in your relationship with the Lord. People who aren't sinners are in real jeopardy. You see good people that aren't sinners go to hell in the end. Sinners who know they are lost and come to Jesus, go to heaven. That's not hard to understand, is it? And all of us sinners here this morning that are really enjoy Jesus know that. But you know, I've been along the way a long time and I still, I've given up on looking for some good in me. It ain't there. But you know what is there? the indwelling Holy Spirit, the very righteousness of Christ is given to me. Not because I earned anything. And if there's any good works associated with me as part of rewards once we get to heaven, which I sincerely believe in, I guarantee you that every one of them that matters to God happened after the Holy Spirit moved in and took over my life. Anything before that, be, I was a good boy, I, I'm a good girl, all that kind of stuff, it buys you nothing in the throne room of heaven and judgment. Okay? Heaven's concern is not how good you try to be. Because as long as you're trying to be good to go to heaven you can be assured you'll never get there. 
Now let's go to today's focal scripture. Matthew 9 verses 14 through 17 says this, Then came to him the disciples of John, John the Baptist, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? Folks, there was an awful lot of jealousy and dissension between the disciples of John the Baptist and those who followed Jesus. They found themselves much more in sympathy with the Pharisees, with their rules and their traditions, than they did with the freedom that Jesus was talking about. Jesus was changing things much too fast for John's disciples to handle. And even John the Baptist himself was probably at this time languishing in prison and he did not like what he saw Jesus doing. Why don't your disciples act like and do more things like us and the Pharisees? Folks, when your relationship with God is any way impacted by what somebody else does or does not do, outside of being born again by the Spirit of God becomes your focus and your determining factor as to whether or not you'll fellowship with them, whether or not, as Jesus constantly did, eat with them or be in any kind of ministry associated with reaching them, whoever them are. Folks, you've got a spiritual problem. You cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit and have any kind of ought against anybody. You can't do it. And that's two basic groups of people. Those in the world that are lost, and no, don't, I don't have time to preach on it, but don't quote to me about, well, the Bible says, come ye out from among them. Because if I hear that one, there's going to be a message. There's going to be a sermon. You've got to be careful how you divide the Word of God. There are people who refuse to do the number one thing Jesus said for us to do, to go ye therefore, all of that. The Great Commission... Because the Bible says that we should come out from among them. Some, so if you want to know what that means, ask me and I'll, I don't mind preaching on it. Okay. Verse 15 says, And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. Folks, who is... It, oh my goodness, as much as y'all hear me preach, you know how I feel about the bride of Christ. You know who I believe with all my heart and know the scriptures say that the bridegroom is. Every time you hear me talk about this church, I'm always talking about the local body of Christ. The greatest love of my life is my bridegroom. Because it is by him that I have been, he's accepted, I was given to him by the Father, and he in no wise will ever reject anyone that the Father sends to him. Now, in that basic theological statement right there hangs your eternity. If God the Father has chosen you, as all fathers back then did choose the bride for their sons, then guess what? The son's going to be glad to get you. So when every one of us who's been saved come to Jesus, and Jesus knows we're coming as a gift from the Father, He, you are, he will accept you as His eternal bride, and He'll be the head of that body that's composed of all of us sent to the Son by the Father. How's that for being special? Now, it's my experience with wives that wives like knowing that they're special. Folks, I am the bride of Christ, and so are all of you that are born again. 
You cannot help but have those smiles on your face I talked about last week because you hear every day from Him in your secret place with Him how special you are. And the joys we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Folks, knowing Jesus and being His bride, part of His bride, is not knowing a bunch of intellectual rules and traditions and various dogmas and procedures. That's not what it is. It is that of a man and a woman in marriage. It's personal. It's real. For you to know Jesus, you've got to really be a part of His life. You've got to really sense that He's enjoying you being in, being in His life. And you know something? He wants to know that you're enjoying Him being in your life. Now, now, that marriage is going to last for eternity. It'll never, there is no divorce rate in heaven. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment for that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment and the rent is made worse. Does anyone here not realize why it says on a pair of jeans, pre-shrunk? Because if you buy one that's uh, not shrunk, and you wash it, it's going to be a different pair of pants the next time you put them on, isn't it? And you'll be passing them down sooner than you wanted to. Um, Jesus is saying through that example and about the wine I'm about to go into that you cannot mix the world's ways. The world's ways when it comes to religion is lots of rules and lots of things you must do in order to be saved. And the way it is structured, it's structured to keep you in bondage because you never quite know if you've done enough to make it. You're not sure. I want you to know what the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches very, very clearly. You do not wait till death to find out whether or not you made it to heaven. There is a spirit of holy God that comes on you and lets you know that you've been accepted and you know that you've been born again. You do not become unborn after that. You can do everything in the church's whatever rule books, whatever we all the denominations have, and unless you've been born again, it does not matter. You can't ask forgiveness enough. You cannot give enough. You cannot work hard enough in any venture or give your body to be burned, as Paul says. You can't do any of that and gain any kind of confidence and security that you're on your way to heaven. Beware of any religion that cannot teach you and will not teach you that you have a real born-again experience. Up front, now you're not perfect at that point, are you? Ah, but you have a token, you have a down payment that the Holy Spirit has come to you personally. You get nothing for being born into the right family. There's a lot of Jews in hell today that listen to Jesus because they thought they were saved and they were obeying all the rules of a 1,700-year-old religion. And they missed their Savior. They missed Him when He came and looked them in the face. Okay, let's talk about the wine now. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, and that, can be that word can be translated wine skins just as easily. Else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish, but they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Folks, it's been 2,000 plus years since Jesus came and offered himself as the new wine to his people Israel. They rejected then 
and for the most part, they still reject today. They are proof to us that we can become so set in our ways and our traditions, even under grace, that we are unable to live filled with the Holy Spirit. If your way, your ways get in the way of the free flow of the filling of the Holy Spirit of God in your life, you have a spiritual problem. You desperately need Jesus intimately and personally. It does not matter what I say as a preacher or some other Bible teacher, or any ecclesiastical authority. It doesn't amount to a hill of beans. But what you know personally between you and Jesus Christ, your beloved bridegroom, that's all that matters. That determines your destiny. Nothing else. Now, once we're saved, and we're living with Jesus in us, we love doing good works, don't we? And every one of those cups of cool water have tremendous unlimited value in heaven. But only after we're born into the kingdom and into the family. Because to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be filled with Jesus. And if we are to be filled with Jesus, we must accept the fact that where he is, there is still disruption of old ways and the status quo. It never goes away where Jesus is at. When we first accepted Jesus into our lives, not much immediately changed. But enough is changed to give us an assurance and an awareness that we now belong to Jesus. And we bear witness to that fact. A newly saved person, a new convert, without a basic witness to the fact that they know Jesus has forgiven their sins and that the Holy Spirit has come into them, has not had a true conversion according to the Scriptures. Okay, but if you have that token of the Holy Spirit in you. Puts us in a position where that the most amazing thing about walking with Jesus from being a baby Christian to a fully mature man or woman in Christ is that we learn more and more each day that Jesus really enjoys being with us. Now how do y'all think I feel about my wife after 50 odd years? Can't remember exactly, honey. But it's a big number. Um, do you think she and I experience our marriage the same way now that we did then? Well, we had some times where we weren't sure we were going to make it. Didn't know. We were children. It's the same way in being the bride of Christ. You stumble when you fall. Your best efforts. I mean, you do everything you can because you have not yet, though you may be saved by the Holy Spirit, you may not yet fully grasp and understand what it means for, have turn, for having turned the reins of your life over to Jesus Christ, your beloved husband. Ah, but once you get a hold of that, you relax and you don't worry about your, your mistakes and things like that. You don't worry about them when you do them because you know the Lord's going to forgive you. But something else happens, and this is the main thing I want you to get a hold of. Um, when we finally realize that Jesus really is in love with us, in spite of all the bad things, all the many sins, 
that he reached down and pulled us out of and still put a wedding ring on our finger. That's enough to get you happy, people. That's why Christians smile a lot. And something else happens. And this is where people get confused about the Scriptures. Having been born again, and now knowing that you're betrothed, wed to, wed to Christ ultimately at the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven, uh, you, know, you know what happens when it comes to your, you repeating your old besetting sins? You slow down on that stuff. See, you're not perfect. But as the days pass, because you know Jesus loves you, you aren't going to hurt Him deliberately, are you? So I want to say this in all sincerity as a pastor. If there is anyone here who professes Christ as your Savior and you're clinging to the benefits of blood-bought grace and you don't have any problems at all sinning greatly over and over and over because you feel like He's going to come bail you out. If that's your theology, you're in trouble. Love does not deliberately hurt the object of your love. If you love your wife, I mean, if I knew, if I do something and I think I've hurt Teresa, it drives me crazy. I don't like it. I don't like her feeling that way. So, neither does a truly born-again child of God try to hold Jesus' feet to the fire because of promises in the Word that are not backed up by love in your heart towards your lover, the lover of your soul. That is a great lie and curse that Satan has used to permeate the Christian churches of all denominations. How terrible! It's always been about you as an individual falling in love with and experiencing the real love of your bridegroom that came and got you. We enjoy Jesus and He enjoys us. We know we're sinners, but we know we're saved sinners. And we continue to sin less because we don't want anything to interrupt our shared happiness. If anything in your life is more important to you than the shared bliss and intimate love of your Savior, the two of you together, you're not living filled with His Spirit. And you're missing an awful lot in what could be yours that was bought for you on the cross. You know, the cross bought you way more than just forgiveness of sins. It bought you a quality of life and for the first time in your life, you may actually find someone that really loves you the way you are. And He takes you and He, and he forgives you and He helps you get better and in so many ways. And you get used to Him saying, you're beautiful. I love you. I made you. Your talents and skills and what you're able to do, I gave those to you, honey. You don't willfully go out and sin against that kind of Savior. Okay, to close this out, that's what theologically we refer to as progressive sanctification. Yes, we're saved in a moment. But our sanctification goes on and on till one day we find ourselves glorified in His presence. That's your destiny, people. And the daily work of the Holy Spirit in you helps further sanctify you, separate you from more and more sins in your life that you really did not understand as sin. The Holy Spirit's very patient. But He's on a timeline to bring you to perfection as you pass from this world into the presence of your lover, the real lover of your soul, Jesus Christ. Dear sinner, 
whether a saved one or an unsaved one, you cannot escape being what you are. You are a sinner. So says the Lord. But you can be born again. And you can enjoy Jesus. And you can sense that you're being enjoyed by Jesus too. And living a Holy Spirit filled life where you sin less and less as He sanctifies you more and more each day. Let us pray. Father, how can we correct and help people whose minds have been so filled culturally and through bad religion, preaching and teaching, so many false things about how to get to heaven. Lord, I ask you that this congregation and those that listen to this online, that they will realize that these words are as simple as this pastor knows how to present them. You must be born again. And the way you know that is you enjoy being with Jesus. And you know Jesus is enjoying being with you. And it's now in this life that that happens and grows and grows and grows till we're all found around the throne. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's stand. If I can help anyone, come on down and let's talk about it. All to Jesus I surrender all to Him I I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I Surrender all to Jesus. I surrender me, be Savior, hold me thy. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit truly know that I am mine. I surrender. surrender all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all to Jesus I surrender Lord I give myself to
okay? Thank you, Thank you folks, again, for being here. Um, come back tonight, come back tonight at 6 o'clock, and we'll, find, and we'll out find out what's going on in Isaiah 2. I promise, I promise you that study, that study will bless your, will bless soul, your soul over these 65, 65 weeks. remaining weeks. Brother Dennis. Brother Dennis. You dismiss. You dismiss us.